Hey everybody, it is me, it's your old buddy, Steve Simonson, and I'm coming back here again with another podcast episode for you from awesomers.com. And today's episode is number 177. Now we're going a little faster and more furious, if you will, uh, recently, because there's all kinds of things happening in this world. Uh, it's, there's chaos, there's pain, there's uncertainty. There are things, well, frankly, that are historic. They've never happened before. Um, ideally they won't happen again but it's happening now and so i feel like it's an important time to uh, talk it through and let you know that like you uh we're facing these challenges and and maybe share some of my insights and some of my observations about how we deal with it and uh, then you can take that on and decide how you should deal with it uh, i'm not here so much to tell you what to do but to tell you how we kind of analyze these things and then the, the, the actions that we try to take. So, um, by the way, I don't know if you could tell, if you're on the audio, you can't tell, but on the video, I've got my, my spike hairdo t t today, like a rhinoceros horn, because I'm, I'm going to battle. Um, everybody should really be on a wartime type footing here. Things are happening very, very quickly around the world, and we're going to talk about some of that today. In particular, we're going to dive into what I see as the coronavirus butterfly effect. And this is a truism at this stage that, you know, something that happened several months ago that had more or less a tiny little origin. So think of this as the butterfly flapping its wings is now having massive global ramifications on the financial side, on the people side, the humanity side, in other words, life and death. Uh, and and it's going to leave a unprecedented mark on the world. It is happening. There, that's undeniable. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen. Uh, I certainly do not. But I have some suspicions and I have some learnings from the past couple months since I've really been tuned into this. And we're going to talk about that today. So a uh, coronavirus butterfly effect episode is going. All right. So what do, what do we mean by butterfly effect? So first of all, uh, the butterfly effect is part of chaos theory, which I'm probably not going to get into too much. Chaos theory is kind of a, a branch of mathematics that, that studies chaos and tries to find a, an underlying pattern to that chaos. Uh, you may have remember uh, the guy from Jurassic Park. I don't remember the actor's name, but he talked a little bit about chaos theory in Jurassic Park, dropping a, a drop of water on the, the back of the hand of the, the female uh, lead. I don't also know her name. <laughs> uh, what a good point of referencing I'm doing. Anyway, in Jurassic Park, the guy from the fly drops the, the water on the woman's hand and says, hey, where's the water going to go? You don't know. It seems like chaos. And, but there really is a pattern based on where it goes and the, the pattern and the ripple and the angle and so forth. And so that's, that's kind of chaos theory. One of the most important parts of chaos theory is something they call the double uh, pendulum. And we'll put an animation at awesomers.com slash 177. So you can see what a double pendulum looks like. And the principle of this double pendulum is you don't know where it's going to go, but in aggregate under chaos theory, when you see it, you do start to see patterns form. And as a matter of fact, there's uh, one of the most, um, I would say, referred to aspects of chaos theory is deterministic chaos. And I'm not going to get into a whole uh, mathematic seminar. In fact, I'm unqualified to do so, but the Lorentz attractor kind of maps out predictable chaos and it looks remarkably like butterfly wings. And this is how kind of the butterfly effect came to be. Now, what is the butterfly effect? So if you saw the movie, I think there was actually a movie with uh, Keanu Reeves. So there's one, one out of three actors I could name so far. And the, the principle is, what if, what if one butterfly in Brazil flaps its wings, can that contribute to, if not be an underlying cause for, a tornado in Texas? So just let that sink in for a minute. The, the principle is, if one little tiny insignificant flap of a butterfly's wings in one place, can that have an impact on something that would be tremendous and tragic in another place? And I can't think of a more suitable uh, analogy to consider than the butterfly effect as it relates to the 
COVID-19 or so-called coronavirus. This is, uh, again, unprecedented times. We have to take a minute and just remember that, you know, the sky is still up there. Uh, the sun is shining or maybe it's raining, whatever, but the world's going around. The world hasn't really changed. We're just dealing with something, the, these animals of humanity that we haven't dealt with before. And it's, it's shaking our systems to the core. Some of these systems that you've probably watched are, uh, you know, China had the, the big lockdown, which, which really just kind of closed China for a couple months. But they seem to be at least emerging on the other side of that after very strict and draconian measures uh, better for it. Their, their number of cases and so forth are dropping. Now, as always, and this doesn't just go for China, this goes for uh, America, Italy, Iran, any country. I don't necessarily trust what they say. I watch what they do. And no matter who I'm dealing with, I maintain an axiom that is trust but verify anyway. So this is not me being critical of one particular uh, government, uh, certainly not race. This is me observing inconsistencies in all of humans everywhere without fail. So uh, China, you know, uh, along with the WHO in mid-January, when I kind of raised the alarm because I didn't trust what they were saying, they're like, eh, it doesn't even seem that this is a, a human to human problem. Uh, we think this is just came from the, the market and it's no big deal. It's probably not even contagious. Don't worry about it. And you can look at that up. That was roughly January 14th where the WHO in China is like, nah, we don't even think this thing is uh, capable of transferring human to human. Yet it was rapidly and rampantly running wild inside of China. Now, China shortly amended that and said, oh, yeah, it turns out it is, in fact, capable of jumping human to human. And it's doing so in a very sig significant way. And within two weeks, they had kind of just shut down all of China. Um, and again, unrivaled, historic, and unprecedented fashion. I, I can't think of additional words for it, but it's truly something that we have not seen before. So, uh, so China did, you know, just like every other country, I think the U S was slow to act. They're like, yeah, we cut off the, the planes to China, you know, to and from China. Well, you know, how could we get it? What possible, uh, issue would we have? Well, it turns out the rest of the world was still interacting and you know, the, this thing, if you can just imagine a map, uh, or go watch one of those movies like contagion, and you can just watch where all these people are flying around the world, taking trains, whatever. <clears throat> and, and then that spreads to each and every other country. Uh, as I recall, at least a news article, I'm not, I wasn't there firsthand to see it, but when Wuhan said, Hey, I'm, I'm guessing at these days, but you know, Hey, it's Wednesday on Friday, we're closing Wuhan. Nobody gets in or out after that point. We're locking her up tight. 10 million people in Wuhan are like, oh, well, I don't want to be here for that. I'm out. And 10 million of them left. And uh, I saw a study from some university that somewhere around 70,000 of them flew away to international locations. So certainly not 100% of those people had uh, the coronavirus, but some number did. And that, that's enough based on the so-called R0 value. This is the measure of how contagious a disease is. This particular COVID-19 has a very aggressive R0 value where, you know, for each person that has it, they spread it. I, I don't know the current numbers, but at that time, it was somewhere around two to three people. So for every person that gets it, two to three additional people will get it from them. And then that carries on and carries on. And then there's this concept of super carriers and blah, blah, blah. So my point is not to jump into the medical side of this equation, which is far beyond me. I don't know anything about any of that. I'm just learning and trying to pay attention. It's simply to paint the picture that this thing started, now it's everywhere, and now we truly see the butterfly effect of what's happening. So let me give you some examples. Just today, just this morning, we are facing some challenges we never expected to face. So one of the things that immediately people started asking me in – uh, at the end of January, when I said, I'm not going to Canton Fair, and you shouldn't either. Uh, let me just do a side rant on this. It appears that the Canton Fair, despite the fairgrounds still being closed as of you know, March 20th, it appears the Canton Fair is going forward. Um, 
I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. If it goes forward, I have to say this is simply a China saving face move. They'll make all the exhibitors go, they'll make them all be there, and it'll be like, we never miss Canton Fair ever. But they shouldn't really let people into it <laughs> because you know that is, that's just like a giant gumbo soup mix of people coming in from around the world only to infect each other and then go back out and, and kind of increase the, the problem. So I don't know if people will be allowed to go, you know, besides the exhibitors and the people who pass health checks uh, there in China. And if they do allow the show to go on, again, in my mind, it's just a face-saving move, similar to allowing EWU to be open right now. I also see that as a face-saving move. Uh, despite EWU offering to pay for flights and even hotels and so forth for buyers to come, I just, I won't recommend it. Even if China has this thing more locked down, it's all of us from outside China that br bring that risk with us. As we know, all across Europe, United States, Canada, Australia, this thing's everywhere. It's everywhere. So we just have to, you know, kind of big picture say, everybody stay away from everybody for a while. And it, two weeks ain't going to be enough for those uh, keeping score at home. I'm afraid that's optimistic to think this will be over in two weeks. This is going to be some number of months. And this, again, is where the butterfly effect really happens. So I mentioned there's some things happening that are unprecedented. And, and in fact, that I said, hey, everybody was calling me saying, hey, I want to source outside of China. This is one I got on my side rant there. And because we said, well, if China shut down, we don't want a single point of failure. Let's have a backup plan. Well, Vietnam's right next to China, so the, the chance of them having uh, the problem is high. And kind of anybody bordering, it seems, it seems high, although Russia has done remarkably well, uh, assuming their numbers are accurate. Uh, having the longest border with China and having such few cases, eh, doesn't really, uh, doesn't really add up, I'll be honest. But just sourcing outside of China is not the answer. So today, um, one of the factories that we um, use uh, for a partner is in Malaysia, and they closed. They're closing for two weeks. And the government said, you're closing, just so you know, for two weeks. Now, I don't know how long that will last, but I think this is just to kind of isolate and quarantine. But that factory outside of China is now closed for two weeks. And we have some, some very critical shipments that we were expecting to ship during this precise time, which means now we're going to likely uh, suffer. Our, you know, our partnership here and our, our customers are going to suffer being out of stock when we thought that we had kind of outmaneuvered this thing. And technically, this maneuver took place some time ago in response to the trade war. But uh, it had a residual effect when China was shut down because this thing kind of carried on. Uh, despite, by the way, some of the managers who went back for Chinese New Year being stuck in the Hubei province as a, uh, as a sad little side story. So this butterfly effect, right? So this, this origin of this problem has now closed down factory in Malaysia, which means there's no safe place to have a factory. For those who have been watching the news in probably anywhere in the world, uh, Pennsylvania, California, uh, maybe others by now have said – you are ordered to stay in your home except for these reasons. So they basically are saying the entire state is on lockdown. They're closing all non-essential businesses, which means, you know, unless you are in this very small type of business, these include necessities like, you know, food and um, that, that includes restaurants doing takeout and delivery. That includes the delivery drivers. That includes logistics people for groceries and essential supplies and so on. This narrow set, they have to stay open because the world needs them. But everybody else is like, go home and stay away from other people. This means there are factories that are closed. They're like the warehouse, uh, there's a warehouse of a Chinese factory that's closed, more than one, by the way, in the Los Angeles area. And this has been a really good factory. Uh, their production is somewhere around, I don't know, 400 containers a month. So big factory, long reputation. I've known them at least 15 plus years. And because of the, this whole situation, even though China's back to work, 
they are they may shutter the china factory until europe and the U us come back online in some significant way because they they think the the demand curve is going to take such a dive they're not going to have enough work for their people and, and you know all the work and overhead and so on. So I, I just want to, to kind of recap that picture. Here's a factory in Malaysia that's closing due to the uh, butterfly effect of coronavirus. Here's a factory in China that is reclosing due to the butterfly effect of the United States and Europe. Um, and, you know, now this is reverberated, right? It doesn't matter politically. I, I'm not into the the who shot Johnny stories of where things began or ended, but we know where it began in China, Wuhan, it's bounced over to the U S and Europe. And now it's having an effect back. If this isn't a butterfly effect, I don't know what is now. There are truly thousands of little side stories that go along with this. If this factory in China closes, what happens to its workers? Do they get paid? Maybe not. Even though I think all the, the governments around the world will try to help their citizens on some basis, if the citizens and the, the world in general, businesses, people are not generating money to pay taxes, there's no money to share. So, you know, as much as people like this idea of, oh, hey, a trillion dollars worth of, you know, U.S. Uh, stimulus or whatever, uh, first of all, that's all debt, so it ain't great financially for the country long term, but at some point that money's gonna have to come in. They have to, to sell bonds to get that money, that cash to pay out. And we have to pay our taxes at some point to get that money into the system. Even at a deficit, we gotta still put some, some capital injections in. So <laughs> I know I'm, I'm kind of you know, cycling around this thing, but all of these little tiny things that are happening are connected and they are having a significant impact. So. What, what does this mean? This means there will be massive layoffs. As we watch Vegas shut down, all the Disneylands are shut down. Now, Disney says it's going to continue to, well, when they close, they said they're going to pay their employees. But I don't know how long that will last because Disney's just like everybody else. If you don't have money coming in, it's hard to pay money going out. And no matter how big a company you are, you have capital constraints. And right now, cash is king. And so there will be massive layoffs across the Western world, as there have been in China already. And these layoffs are because of necessity. A business can't pay if it doesn't produce revenue. And when somebody gets laid off, now they're either claiming benefits or they have to hustle to figure out how to pay their bills. Some countries, I believe Italy, maybe Canada, have put moratoriums on things like rent, mortgages, credit cards, et cetera. And there, there's probably more of that that will happen. The problem is when you get a moratorium on mortgages, for example, and they, uh, you know, Italy goes, hey, you don't have to pay your mortgage for a couple months. For the individual homeowners, that's like, all right, cool, I'm not getting repossessed immediately. But does that mean they're, they're paying interest during that time or do they, they just owe that money in two months or three months? You know, is this deferring the, the payment or is it eliminating the payment? The mortgage companies are going, hey, how are we going to pay for stuff? And that's why the U.S. Um, for the, the repo market alone pumped like $50 billion or $100 billion into that market for liquidity because all these companies who rely on that, pay, that payment from their mortgages, rents, et cetera, and then have to pay off notes and loans and interest, this is a vicious cycle. This is that butterfly effect, you know, Every little link in the chain has ramifications. And when they happen in mass and they're aggregated across the globe, it's extraordinary results. So I, I heard a report yesterday where uh, the U.S. is expected to contract, not grow, but contract by 14% in the second quarter. And frankly, I think they may be uh, estimating a bit low. Um, and by the way, that's the second quarter, which starts um, April, May, June. So who knows what's happened in uh, January, February, March, right? Where we're just getting the beginning effect of this, but it's going to be um, a, a financial impact for sure and, and, and probably negative growth in my estimation. All right, so what does this mean? First of all, as always, we don't panic. We observe we adapt, we carry on. 
that's all we can do. But what it does mean is we need to really think about where that demand curve is going to uh, go in our own categories. There are some products that the demand curve is spiking to all-time highs. And there are other categories that the, the, it's going the opposite direction. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, if you don't know which one, which category you're in and which way the, the trend is headed, you're not prepared. So take note now, go get prepared, figure out which side of that equation you're on and whichever one, you know, you either have a supply side problem or a demand side problem. Some of our categories, by the way, have both, right? We've got some products that are in high demand, but the factories are shuttering for some of these reasons I just mentioned. By the way, those, those two bits of stories, the one in Malaysia and the one in China, that, that was completely unexpected. Um, I could have saw it coming. Certainly, yeah, I, you know, in some ways I think I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. And uh, now we have to figure out what our options are and how do we deal with you know, those gaps. Do we have a choice? You know, what, are, what are our options, essentially? So because I, you know, I can see the, the pain that's going to come, I want people to be very, very cautious. I, I, I recorded an episode the other day. I don't recall what episode number it was. Let me just uh, look it up because it's important for you to go take a listen. Uh, it's osmers.com slash 176. Oh, is the, the most recent one. Is that right? No, 175. Check 175. Osmers.com slash 175. Well, frankly, you should listen to them all. But on Osmers.com slash 175, I shared nine specific actionable tactics you can take uh, so that you can kind of, you know, calmly just kind of go through your business and be prepared. Those are action steps you should really take. Osmers.com slash 175. Check that out. Um, all right, I'm just looking at my list here. All right, I think I've covered uh, the important stuff. This butterfly effect, this tiny little virus has created extraordinary turmoil and destruction across the world, and we have only seen the beginning of it. And I don't, I'm not a political animal, so I don't really care what politicians say, but they don't know what they're talking about. They've never been the brightest bulbs in the bunch, and I don't care which side of the aisle, uh, aisle that you're on. They're all kind of just power-hungry narcissists, in my opinion. And you can pick your favorite and say they're amazing and, and say the other guys are, you know, evil tyrants. Um, I don't care. I just see them as uh, kind of annoyance. And at best, they're good at governance. That's what we hope. We want them to be good at governance and good at solving problems. And no, no country, not the United States, not China, not Italy, no country was prepared. Even as we started seeing data, everybody kind of just maintained their, their denial. And I've been talking about this since, I don't know, the middle of January at the latest, saying this is serious. I've never seen anything like this. And I got a ton of feedback. Ah. The flu kills more people, bah, bah, bah. This is just like the flu. And I'm like, I hear you. I understand those data points. How many flus have shut down Disneyland? How many flus have shut down flights between countries? How many flus have shut down states, economies, countries? Answer is none. That's never happened. Because the flu doesn't create the same kind of problem, this massive wave of people needing uh, significant medical, medical care, which the medical system cannot scale up to. Even, even Amazon, as brilliant as they are with their logistics, and Costco for that matter, any of these companies, Walmart, none of them are prepared to have toilet paper in stock due to these crazy surges. Now, I still, I still can't do the math on why toilet paper's got such a, uh, a, a critical demand for it. Uh, everybody's really planning on hunkering down, I guess, for a long time. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's other options uh, out there. So th the point is nobody's prepared for this. Anybody who wants to criticize somebody go, oh, you didn't do this or you didn't do that. You know, we can, we can play the blame game later. But right now we need to stay away from each other. You know, 
isolate, uh, that means don't go to the, the party. I know people are like, oh, groups of 10 or less. I, you know, my group is my family right now. We might go out and get some food, but we'll do it in a drive-thru. We might have to stop and get groceries. But we'll do it as quick as we can and try to be conscious of those around us. And, you know, one of my principles, one of my founding kind of gut feels is be mindful of others. You know, at first I was like, ah, this thing is not going to get me. I'm going to keep traveling and keep doing what I do and I'm not going to break pace. But it was very clear um, hours after making, you know, kind of my, I'm coming to Vegas. It was like, no, no, I'm not going to be part of the problem. And so I, I don't know any more than anybody else. I am not saying I have all the answers, but I am saying that I'm watching, I'm paying attention. Uh, I certainly knew that this is going to have some consequences. And I'm telling you today in the middle of March, 2020, the consequences, the big ones are still coming. We haven't seen them yet. Um, we're getting a sense of them. We're watching the stock market, you know, get destroyed and, and watching wealth be wiped off the map at uh, really historic rates. And, you know, hopefully uh, those won't be repeated. And I'm certain that as things come back and this, that we will get through this, these types of things will go back together. The underlying fundamentals of the economy, at least in the United States and many of the global economies, they're pretty solid, but only to the extent we can kind of plug those things back in uh, without too much delay. Kind of think of this like power cycling your router, right? When your internet's bad or your computer's screwing up, you power cycle it. And we're, we're power cycling the world right now. The butterfly effect from the coronavirus is causing us to power cycle the entire frickin' industrial world. And that is... I don't know any other way to say it. It's crazy. It's unprecedented. And I can't imagine this situation happening again. And, and the moment I say that, I should say that once this pandemic is kind of over, it's, it's likely we'll have another one of these. So I hope that we learn the lessons. You know, as I've studied, you know, people like Bill Gates and many doctors and They've been talking about this is what the threat is to the globe, not nuclear war, but this type of thing. And we need to run germ games, not just war games, but germ games. And those few that we've run have always had terrible outcomes. So all the practice that they've been doing for the last five to 15 years has shown we're not prepared, but no government, no set of governments invested in a solution because it had never come to pass since the Spanish flu of 1918, and hopefully it won't be as bad as that, but who knows? So anyway, I, I hope you guys understand that this butterfly effect will have massive consequences up and down your supply chain, your customers, right? All those customers who are buying your product, if they don't have a job, it's going to be hard for them to buy your product. So be prudent about how much stock and inventory you're doing. Be prudent with you know, trying to get terms with your factory and working with them in a transparent, honest, and fair way to share the burden. Many factories will get help from the government. You know, many companies will get help from the government for capitalization. And all of that can spread down to us, uh, you know, so-called trickle-down economics, if we are able to leverage some of those relationships. And so, um, you know, I think one of our... Uh, uh, key partners and, and brilliant uh, colleagues, he took it upon himself to say, hey, listen, we need to ask our suppliers instead of 60 days for 90 day terms right now because we're, we're scared. We don't know what's going to happen and we can use some help. And we share that burden with, with our, our partners and colleagues and friends and so forth. And we also don't unfairly burden you know, any one side. Everybody's in this together. So don't take on the whole problem yourself, share the burden and, and, I'll, and we'll come through this. So thanks again, everybody. I hope this is helpful to you. You know, I don't know if I'm wasting my breath here sometimes. Uh, I do hear from people when I go to events or I get messages and they're like, Hey, thanks for your stuff. You know, the, the YouTube channel and the podcast, and it's all really valuable. Thanks. Uh, but it, it helps me to, to hear that feedback, I'll be honest, because sometimes I'm like, well, I'm just talking to myself over here. 
so if you do get the chance to subscribe, leave a review, uh, give some feedback, that would be helpful. Even if you say I'm a complete nut job who doesn't know what he's talking about, I'm okay with that. Uh, it actually at least lets me know that we're having a conversation instead of me just uh, being a talking head and uh, talking to myself, essentially. So uh, anyway, uh, this episode, uh, awesomers.com slash 177. You can go check out show notes. I'll, I'll include uh, some links to the butterfly effect and chaos theory and, and just a, a couple show notes there so that you have that uh, at, at your fingertips. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, awesomers.com signing off. See y'all later. Bye-bye.